Sir, you've got the floor. Go ahead. All right. Well, as I understand it, my mandate here is I'd like me to talk a little bit about myself, my district, the day-to-day uh, -day life in the capital, uh, and what it what entails it uh, representing a district in the, in the Missouri General Assembly. So myself, I'm Curtis Trent, uh, fifth generation Missourian, grew up here in southwest Missouri, Douglas County, uh, grew up near Ava, and if you know where that is. Um, went to Missouri State University for undergrad, uh, studied political science, and, and uh, got a minor in history. Uh, then I went to law school at St. Louis University. Uh, when I got out of uh, law school, I took the bar examination, passed the bar, I am a attorney, uh, licensed here in the state of Missouri. Uh, and then following law school, I got in politics pretty quickly. I joined the first campaign uh, for our congressman, Billy Long. Uh, and after he was successful in that endeavor, I went with him to Washington as his deputy chief of staff, uh, and served in that capacity for uh, about four years, came back to Southwest Missouri, came back to Springfield, did Social Security Disability Law uh, for a couple of years until the previous uh, representative that had the 133rd District, Eric Burleson, turned out. Uh, and when that seat came open, I ran and, and was successful, and I've represented that district for two years now. Um, you can kind of see the district uh, here on the on the map. The map's a little small. Chestnut is the northern boundary. Uh, Kansas, scenic golden in the east. Uh, this is actually Kansas right here. That's as far uh, east as it goes. This is the county line uh, down here in the south. So all the city battlefield. And then um, Hazeltine Road is the road out in the west. It stopped just short of Republic. It's out over here. And that's where Representative Jeff, Jeff Messenger, uh, his district begins, uh, covers all of the public. So that's kind of the boundaries, kind of a tall, thin uh, district. Now the day-to-day -day, uh, representing uh, a, a district in the General Assembly uh, varies pretty widely. So from January to May, we're part-time legislature. So January to, from, to, from January to May, uh, we spend a lot of time in Jefferson City. Usually four-day weeks, we give up on Monday. Uh, have a regular session all week and come back on Thursday afternoon, fairly late typically. Uh, but while you're in Jefferson City, uh, all kinds of things go on. Uh, of course, legislation is the biggest uh, part of that, so you're uh, in committees a lot, uh, you're on the floor a lot, and you can kind of uh, follow the process uh, just through the, the schedule of the representatives. So early on in the session, uh, we're mostly in committee. No, no bills have come out of committee, you can't do anything on the floor until you get bills out of committee. So there's a lot of committee work in the first one, two months of the session. Uh, then as bills begin to, to get out of committees, to get out of the rules committee and onto the floor, uh, then as the uh, session goes along, as you get toward the end of the session, you start having more and more and more floor time and much less committee time. Because there's a certain amount of time it takes for a bill to go through the process from committee to the floor and then, and then on through. So at some point in the process, uh, you reach uh, a time crunch where if a bill is just now starting out in committee, and we're in March or certainly in April, and a bill is just starting out in committee, absent some really unique circumstances, like if it's a bill the leadership really wants and it gets fast track, then maybe. But if it's just going through the regular process, you probably have no chance of getting it through uh, the process if it's starting out that late. So, the sweet spot uh, for bills is to get a bill heard in committee and out onto the floor, preferably even out of the House to the Senate before we have our spring break, uh, which is pretty close to when you all have your spring break as well. Uh, so uh, a lot of committee work, a lot of legislative work. You're meeting with people all the time. Uh, that's another uh, big part of your day. Uh, you have constituents come up. You have groups that come up that have, have interest in bill uh, that's in, in front of the house, uh, all kinds of people who want to, to meet uh, with uh, their representatives or with representatives in general. Uh, so, you know, certainly most members, and I certainly include myself in this, try to give people who have traveled all the way to Jefferson City as much time as possible uh, to meet, uh, to hear uh, their perspective, uh, to hear uh, what they would like to see happen uh, in the General Assembly. Now, when we're not in session, so after May, so June to December, uh, you have a, a much different set of, of activities that you're involved in. Uh, if 
it's a campaign year, like uh, like this year, an even number of years, and you're probably knocking a lot of doors, you're putting out signs, you're going to candidate forums, you're going to all kinds of, of political activities that, that take place, uh, and so you're you're very busy with all that. If it's a an off year cycle, so you're not up for election that year, uh, then the, there's a there's less that goes on, but there's still quite a bit, and a lot of the uh, oversight, you have interim committees, committees that are operating just on an oversight capacity uh, will uh, will take place uh, frequently during during the off-year cycles. Uh, I was a member of a subcommittee of the Higher Education Committee. Higher Education is one of the committees I sit on regularly. Uh, but we had a subcommittee on student debt relief uh, that operated in the interim uh, last year. So that's a, a good example of, of the type of work that can take place. Uh, uh, during uh, the, the off year. Uh, I guess I should probably go back and talk a little bit about uh, the committee process is not just legislation, but it's also oversight. Uh, so another committee that I sit on is the budget committee, uh, which is one of the biggest committees in the House. Uh, and so not only is it charged with putting together the budget for the state, it's the body of origination for the state's budget. Uh, but it also does a lot of oversight as a part of that process. So we have department heads from every department come in. Uh, they present their budget request to us. Uh, they go over any new items that they want to add or any old items that are dropping off. And we have an opportunity at that point to really talk to them in open committee to explore uh, you know, what is being done in, in that department, uh, how the money is being spent, where it can be spent better, where it does, doesn't need to be spent, or where it more needs to be spent. Uh, and so that's a real big part of the, of the process, too, and I think that's one of the most important parts of the process that the people's representatives uh, can perform, is to do that oversight to make sure that, uh, that the laws are being implemented, that the budget is being implemented in the way uh, that, it, that it's supposed to be, the way that it was, that it was passed, and, and that doesn't always happen. So it's, uh, it's good to have that double check uh, on everything. So now the, that's kind of a, an, an overview of, of what goes on in the, in the legislative process. <coughs> What's the next part of my mandate? Uh, could you talk a little bit about, uh, we have had one of your colleagues earlier today, Crystal Quay, who explained why she gravitated towards the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about why you gravitated towards the party, the Republican Party, the party you did? Sure. So the reason why I'm a Republican, well, there's several reasons. The, the first reason I'd say maybe one of, the, one of the biggest reasons uh, is that I, I believe the Republican Party focuses more on the individual. Uh, so your individual rights, your individual opportunities, how we can promote you as an individual. Uh, I think anytime government tries to choose between individuals uh, or tries to choose between groups of people, uh, that's a political decision that is made. Government is inherently political in its operation. And a lot of times government will get it wrong. So rather than try to choose between individuals or choose between groups, I think government should focus on uh, preserving the rights and the, and the opportunities of the individual and then let uh, each individual's own merit, own hard work, uh, propel them forward to wherever that they choose to go. Because I think part of the responsibility of government is to not decide where society should, that should go. That's society's decision to make. Uh, but instead should focus on how it can create an environment that lets each individual pursue their own happiness in the way that they want to pursue it. Uh, because ultimately, I can't know what makes you happy, what you, what, what hobbies you like, uh, how you want to spend your own money that you earn, uh, what kind of job you want to have to earn that money. Uh, I could sit around and speculate. I could look at like, broad data and say, well, you know, a certain percentage of society historically is one to be. Uh, bankers in another section is one to be scientists in another section is one to be uh, artists, but there's really no way for me to, to drill down to the individual level and say that's what you want to do. Uh, and, and you may not know either, and your mind may change. So I think creating that stable environment to let people explore life for themselves and, and pursue their own happiness is, is an important uh, thing that uh, that government should uh, should stay out of, should enable from a like, broad over. Level. Uh, I also believe in incremental change, uh, evolutionary change, not revolutionary change. Uh, and I think the Republican Party is 
most geared toward that incremental evolutionary change. Uh, so, you know, societies are very complex entities. Uh, we just talked about there are all kinds of different individuals who have all kinds of different desires and inclinations. And when you go in with public policy, uh, which is a very blunt instrument, and you try to use incentives or penalties to shift people in one direction, to, to change their behavior in some way, uh, which is really what the object of a lot of public policy is, uh, you may get it wrong, and you may get it wrong spectacularly. But if you try to make those changes one piece at a time, uh, hopefully you figure out that you're getting it wrong before you've gone too far and created too many disruptions, and then you can change course. So those are kind of the two, two broad reasons why uh, I'm a Republican. We could go into a lot more uh, philosophy. Uh, you know, I like political science and history. Uh, I think that uh, the nature of our public institutions, the history of our country, more closely al aligned with Republicanism, small r Republicanism. And I think that uh, the Republican Party is the home of that kind of philosophy uh, in modern American politics. And so that kind of leads me to gravitate there as well. Uh, but, uh, now, I, I, a, I'm willing to bet you didn't arrive at the Republican Party or conservatism purely intellectually. I think you give a great intellectual defense of conservatism. My guess is, like almost all of us, you grow up into your beliefs. What was the story of that like? Uh, were you always conservative? Did you shift over to it? Was there a world events that pushed you one way or another? No, it was it was really a gradual evolution in my life as well. I mean, my family is very uh, what you call conservative. What you know, they were, they were Republican, uh, have been for, for many generations. Uh, my uh, I have an ancestor that fought in the Civil War at the Battle of Wilson's Creek uh, here here in our area uh, on the side of the Union, uh, which was like the first Republicans. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it's it's a it's a kind of long family tradition uh, of Republicanism. But, um, but no, in my own, my own personal uh, journey uh, to, to come to my philosophical beliefs uh, happened very incrementally. So I, mean, I had the example of my family. I read a lot uh, of history. Uh, I read a lot of philosophy. Uh, I, I, looked at the, I tried to look at the individuals who wrote our Constitution and not just look at what they said, but, uh, but try to figure out who influenced them, uh, who they, they read and studied in order to come up with the ideas that they came up with. Uh, and, and that led me in that direction as, as well. Um, so, I, you know, there's really no, no single life event or anything that, that pushed me uh, into uh, conservatism. Uh, I probably was a little more libertarian leaning uh, when, I was, when I was younger, uh, but um, for the most part, uh, as as I, I I started out as a Republican, as I learned more about philosophy and about history, uh, it only strengthened my leaning toward the toward that party, and kind of solidified what I had already uh, kind of adopted through through the culture that I grew up in. Was there ever a moment in your adulthood where you could point to something that occurred in public policy or in our country's culture where you were like, that right there is why I belong to the party I belong to? No, I couldn't. I couldn't point to any singular. Pivotal event like that. So, um, why get into politics? Why was that a choice that you made? Well, I was through that decision process. So, I, I've always had the interest. I mean, that's part of what led me to law as well. Because in many ways, the history of law in our country is a is a political history. I mean, our our legal system uh, is in many ways adopted from the British common law system, uh, which has a very old uh, heritage. Uh, so it, it's kind of been like a, a personal interest uh, for a long time. Uh, but I also think that in order for our system of government to work, uh, our system of government is predicated on self-governance. Uh, that we are not ruled by a distant elite. Uh, we are not ruled by people who we cannot touch. Uh, we self-rule. Our leaders are chosen from amongst ourselves. Uh, they serve at our pleasure. They serve the will of the people. And then at the end of their time in office, when they're done, they return to the public uh, from whence they came, and they live under the laws that they have to create. Um, and so I think that in order for that system to work, uh, each of us has to participate in that. And that participation is more than just voting. 
Uh, it is uh, educating ourselves about the nature of government, about the nature of humankind. Uh, it, is, it is about uh, communicating uh, our will to the people who represent us. Uh, it's about advocating for the things that we believe in. Uh, and not everyone can do everything. Uh, some people don't have the interest and inclination to run for public office themselves. Uh, some people don't have the interest or the inclination to uh, watch a lot of news and, and be, a, be a political junkie uh, and, and trying to figure out every little thing that's going on. Uh, but everyone can do something, and I think everyone should do something to try to preserve uh, our institutions because our institutions have served us very well. Uh, the system of self-governance that we have uh, enables us to solve a lot of problems and gives our society an amount of flexibility that other societies uh, don't have. Uh, because it, it, it enables us to change. Uh, our country has, has grown and changed dramatically uh, since it was founded. Uh, I, I believe under most other systems of government in, in the world, uh, you would have seen multiple revolutions, you would have seen multiple uh, dramatic changes of government uh, because those governments that are based on one party rule or hereditary rule or uh, you know some kind of uh, council of elites uh, that, that oversee society and are, are the keepers of, of, the, uh, of the government. Uh, they lack the flexibility to change when circumstances around them change and, and when they get too far out of sync with where society is at and where the world is at, uh, they fail and they fail catastrophically. And if we don't want our system to become brittle, uh, then I think it's incumbent upon us to be uh, particip active participants in that system. Uh, what can, can you remind us what committees you work on again? Uh, so budget committee, uh, we talked about it quite a bit earlier, state budget. Uh, special litigation reform committee, which is essentially a court reform committee. So it looks at, uh, you know, plaintiff versus defendant liability, uh, you know, how, you know, all the, all the different details that go into that. I'm on higher education, uh, which is uh, primarily uh, charged with our, our university systems around the state and public universities. Uh, and I'm on a kind of procedural committee, it's called the Consent House Procedure. So it's really important once every two years when the rules of the House are drafted. Uh, and then it's uh, sort of important the rest of the time when you have consent water notes, consent bills, which are essentially non-controversial bills. So we're naming a bridge, or we're doing, basically we're doing something that doesn't spend money or change any substantive area of law. Uh, and this committee will examine those bills and see if they meet that definition. If they do, uh, then they're passed on to the floor and they're unamendable on the floor, which is a fast track process. They don't think they can get down. How'd you end up on those committees? Did you say, please put me on budget, or were that, was that bestowed upon you? It's, it's both requested and bestowed. So I requested to be on budget. Uh, it was my, my number one pick, uh, and the speaker was kind enough to put me on that, that committee. But it is ultimately the speaker's choice what committee should go on. Uh, and so, you know, it's a, it's a process like anything else where you let your preferences be known, uh, but then you kind of have to lobby the speaker and, and try to try to get uh, him to, to uh, agree with your with your preferences. Sounds good. Now, you can you tell us a story about uh, what's a piece of legislation that you've worked on you're particularly proud of, whether it succeeded or didn't succeed. Well, I'll pick ones that succeeded since I can since I can do that. So I worked on uh, House Bill 1880 in this last session. Uh, it is a bill uh, that is part uh, broadband development and part tort reform. Uh, so the problem uh, that our rural co-ops were having that they currently provide electricity, uh, they are deploying high-speed internet cable uh, in support of that electricity transmission uh, operation. Uh, we've got a lot of new technology coming on online, like smart grids and switching stations that use, uh, you know, internet computer capabilities to to more closely uh, hone how the electricity is, is delivered and managed in the system, to monitor the system. Uh, to, you know, if a, if a uh, pole breaks, uh, it saves a lot of money if the like, if the uh, company can know exactly which pole has has broken and exactly what's wrong with it so they can dispatch a truck with exactly what they need to fix it uh, because it costs uh, several thousand dollars every time a truck has to has to roll out. Uh, so 
the co-ops are already deploying this high-speed internet capability along their existing 